From UFOs to psychic powers and government conspiracies, history is riddled with unexplained events. You can turn back now or learn the stuff they don't want you to know. A production of iHeartRadio. Hello, welcome back to the show. My name is Matt. My name is Noel. They call me Ben. We're joined, as always, with our super producer, Paul Mission Control Deccans. Most importantly, you are you, you are here, and that makes this the stuff they don't want you to know. I have uh, returned, fortunately, uh, here to our fair metropolis of Atlanta. It's at least for the time being. It's very good uh, to see you guys. And I, uh, I can't wait to dive into your this. mysterious adventures in the Pacific. Right? The That's what we're talking about today. <laughs> the mysterious adventures of a guy who was. Uh, in the in the Pacific area when he died, uh, that's uh. it's like the pawn shop meme, Matt. That that was my best I can do is answer. Uh, so here we are looking at a story we I think we all learned about in an earlier listener mail segment, the strange, bizarre tale of a fellow named Thomas Merton, uh, M-E-R-T-O-N. For a lot of folks today, this may be uh, an unfamiliar case. This guy was a monk, an author, a peace activist. Uh, He could rightly be called a mystic. He was perhaps most well-known for his interfaith studies. He was also known uh, for his work in social justice. And there's, there's a huge genre, you could call it, of holy figures working in the realm of social justice. And when we say social justice, we don't mean the internet meme of an SJW or social justice warrior. What we mean is people who are fighting against far-right governments, they're fighting against big corporations, they're trying to do what they feel is the most uh, holy or in Merton's case, the most Christian thing to do, which is to stick up for people who cannot stick up for themselves. And he did this through pacifism, through writing. He wasn't a warrior monk in the physical sense is what we're saying. Uh, He He also spoke a lot to in front of many people. Yeah, and he wrote a lot, too. He had like dozens of books that he wrote in a pretty short amount of time, relatively speaking. Yeah, yep. He was a prolific author. He originally wanted to be a poet. Uh, In just the space of 27 years, less than 30 years, he wrote more than 50 books. And in December of 1968, he was found dead. This created a mystery that, according to multiple sources, remains unsolved in the present day. And before we begin, uh, I, I wanted to ask you all, prior to that piece of listener mail we received from a fellow conspiracy realist. Had any of us ever heard of Thomas Merton? The name was immediately familiar to me when I read it, when I just saw it on an email, uh, but I could not place it anywhere. But after, after literally searching it on Google for a second, you see his face and I know I have encountered him before, but I was, you know, it wasn't like I had a bunch of things stored from him in my mind. No, I, I felt the same way. I, he, does, he does have a look to him, doesn't he? He's got a certain twinkle in his eye that, like, has some recognition for me as well. But, you know, it wasn't until I, you know, was digging in for this episode specifically that I really realized how he was such a huge influence on so many folks who maybe go down that uh, path of pure, devout uh, Christianity or decide to become a monk or, you know, perhaps join a particular sect or devote their lives to God in that way. Um, So if you were someone who was maybe from the church uh, or did those kinds of studies, I'm sure he would be very, very familiar to you. Uh, I am not that person, um, so he was not, but fascinating guy. Really looking forward to digging into this uh, unsolved mystery and this man's life. And it should be mentioned that his books sold hundreds of thousands of copies, and so it wasn't just the church, right? It was, it was, Ooh. there was a wide audience for I'm glad his you, Yeah, I'm glad you point that out because, uh, it, as you can tell by the date of death, December, late 1960s, we're talking about a peace activist 
at a time when peace was considered by some authorities to itself be a dangerous proposition. Uh, this is a time when operations like COINTELPRO actively monitored, stalked, or harassed uh, various civic leaders, including, of course, uh, most famously, Martin Luther King Jr. And Dr. King, I was thinking of a way to compare this. So Dr. King is, if we consider him sort of a Shakespeare or on the level of Shakespeare in the fight for civil rights in the U.S., then you could, uh, you could conceivably consider Thomas Merton to be a Christopher Marlowe or Ben Johnson, someone who is also tre tremendously influential, uh, but perhaps not as well known today as they were in their time. So make no mistake, whether or not you have heard of Thomas Merton, and you're going to hear a lot about him today, uh, he, he was up there in the pantheon of anti-war activism. And his approach, his strategy was different, but like Dr. King, he was a very well-known orator. Uh, he was quite a prolific writer. People came to him for a spiritual and a practical perspective. So, here are the facts. He was born on January 31st, 1915, in France, in the Pyrenees, uh, to two artists, Owen Merton and Ruth Jenkins. Ruth Jenkins was uh, from the U.S. Owen Merton was a Kiwi. He was from New Zealand. They were good parents. Uh, and Thomas Merton was a bad kid. That's right. Um, in... His time at Cambridge University during the 30s, he was uh, a hard partier. He essentially dropped out um, in favor of just kind of like, you know, hitchhiking, I guess, around Europe. He was in and out of jail, uh, and he eventually had a child out of wedlock, which is a big no-no in, uh, in the Christian faith. Um, a dude named Tom Bennett, who was an old friend of Thomas's father, uh, kind of took him under his wing, but that got old pretty quickly. So he decided he was done bailing this kid out of jail uh, and, you know, floating him money that he was just going to blow on booze and, you know, uh, cheap rent or, you know, hotels and things like that. Um, not to mention that he was still having to pay for classes at Cambridge. I think he didn't drop out officially. He just kind of, you know, went AWOL, right, Ben? Yeah, he was, he was loose. Uh, which means disreputable, basically. And he was, he was one of those kids who's kind of traveling on a benefactor's dime. If you have, if you have traveled in your younger years to various parts of the world, you have met these people. And they can be at times insufferable. Uh, this is, yeah. this yeah. is just a growing phase. Yeah, and it, it is something important, right? It's It's important for his life that he went through that, I think. That he explored in that way it gave him a, a a perspective on life that he wouldn't have had if you know he just was buttoned up and had a whatever you would consider a standard quiet upbringing that's a really good point he saw you know how the other half lived i guess because he was the other half and when i say that i don't mean like the privilege necessarily i kind of just mean like sinners he was very much aware of what it meant to live the life of a of a quote-unquote sinner so this guy, Tom Bennett, to spend a little time on him, I uh, guess, very, very old friend of Owen Merton and took on the took on the responsibility of caring for Thomas, sort of like a ward. Thomas was while and out um, Cambridge and several other universities in the UK have been known for these clubs that dedicate themselves to decadence, revelry. Uh, there's even one club, I can't remember the name or the specific institution, uh, that is known for being composed entirely of cartoonishly rich college students who intentionally wreck restaurants when they go to them. Like, just so you know, that's the world in which this guy is living. Eventually, Tom Bennett has just had enough. And he said, look, dude, you have to get it together. You have to shape off or ship out like you are. You are almost 20 years old. You have a kid. Merton, by the way, never meets this kid during his lifetime. Uh, and you have the rest of your life and you need to start taking it seriously. So Merton obviously knows he's never going to graduate Cambridge. 
He's burned a lot of bridges, candidly, in Europe. So he ships off to New York City, cue the salsa commercial line, in January 1935. He's just turned 20. He applies to study at Columbia University, and this is where his life changes. This is a moment he writes about pretty frequently in uh, in his later autobiography. This is where Catholicism really comes into Thomas Merton's story and into his life and while he's at Columbia. And not, well, I mean, it's a while after, what is it, six years maybe after he arrives there, he ends up at the Abbey of Gethsemane in 1941. And this is where he decides to become this thing called a Trappist monk. And as we said before in the listener mail episode, you may have heard that term before just with regards to a a beverage that you enjoy drinking, a a Mm -hmm. beer perhaps. Um, But this is a, this is a lifestyle, a type of monastic existence. He joined the order of Cistercians of the strict observance. Sounds like fun, huh? Yeah. Yeah. But you know, again, you can, you can see why maybe he would, you can see why maybe he would want to if he got really touched in his initial journeys into Catholicism and thought back on his life. You can maybe imagine like why he would want to take this route. Right. Yeah. He's sown some wild oats. Uh, he feels like his life experiences have informed his choice uh, because, you know, to join a monastic order is no small enterprise and it requires some careful consideration. So he he thought about this closely, but he didn't ever quite fit in to the idea of, of uh, the Trappist existence, which is pretty communal. I mean, he wanted to be a poet. Uh, he was outgoing to uh, left-wing protests and demonstrations early on. Uh, he was also fascinated by Eastern religion and studied it extensively, looking toward commonalities, toward uh, spiritual points of intersection and agreement. Not too long ago, just a few centuries ago or so, this is the kind of stuff that would get you in big trouble with the Catholic Church. Uh, In 1948, another, you know, about seven years, uh, he has published an autobiography that propels him to international fame. It is called The Seven Story Mountain. It's a good read, candidly, uh, if it is a bit, um, I don't want to say sensationalistic or necessarily embellished. Like, I don't want to say he's lying, but he's styling on it. Uh, and later in life, in fact, Merton would himself kind of kind of distance uh, his present identity from the, so the version of him that is the protagonist of this autobiography. At this point, he's, he's into Buddhism as well, right? Yeah. Yeah. With the Eastern religions in, in general, he's He will go on to correspond with various religious officials from Eastern religions uh, and and have these really productive, deep philosophical conversations with them. Like, don't get us wrong. You know, I know there's a little bit of a stereotype that comes about when we talk about people who've dedicated their lives to one form of religion or the next. But this guy seems like he's really chill and fun to hang out with. Like he'll talk to you like he is not, he hasn't grown up in a monastery or anything. He was wiling out not too long ago, you know, and he became like, he lived more life by the time he was 20 than many people have lived into their thirties or forties. And, I, I love, Ben, that yeah. you're talking about melding f- philosophical schools there in a way, because that's really kind of what he's doing. He's letting one inform the other a bit, but uh, it, it, it's 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 his writing and specifically that book was very, very inf- influential on young men returning from World War II. Right. That's and it's because I think and I'm not a scholar on on this, uh, but I do think that it's because it felt open, maybe because it was bringing in concepts from far flung parts of the world uh, and melding that philosophy into something that maybe an individual can see as helpful to them. 
Right, yeah, and this is also being um, written in a larger cultural context. It is the end of World War II. People are returning from parts of the world they never thought they would visit, and with them, they're bringing cultural artifacts, uh, both tangible and intangible, so not just physical souvenirs, but belief systems. And this this is um, an ecosystem in which Merton thrives. He chafes a little bit. This is interesting when you read about his life. He chafes a little bit under the authority of the church and the monastery because the Trappist existence is pretty communal. And as anyone who enjoys, or maybe a better word is uh, is compelled to write, it can be kind of a solitary existence. So when he's writing extensively about concepts like justice, peace, interfaith, what do we, what are we all searching for when we think of the concept of God? Uh, he, eventually he asked the leaders of the monastery, can I just be a hermit? Can I just like, just give me a shack. It doesn't have to be in a good part of the grounds. Just like, let me hang out and write. And they're like, hey, you know, we talked about this when you were becoming a monk. We're we're kind of communal here, uh, but he does he does get them to kind of I don't want to say make exceptions, but customize his existence there. So he's always always writing. Uh, he's got tons of journals. He makes poems, uh, some of which you you can easily read online about political social concerns of the day. He's corresponding with a lot of. Um, I guess you could call him liberation theologist uh, in Mexico and South America. And he, they, the monastery makes a deal with him where they say, okay, well, why don't you become a lecturer? And you can lecture, um, you, you can lecture students, you can lecture younger monks. Uh, and then this becomes a way for him to sit around and write. If you have ever lived in or known someone who's lived in a intentional community or a communal lifestyle, what one of the big things about those communities is distribution of work. So a lot of them fall apart when it comes to the nuts and bolts stuff of like, okay, we're growing our own food. That's awesome. Who's going to actually grow it? Okay, we're, we're self-sufficient. Uh, you know, we use fertilizer. Who collects the poop? Who drops the night, night soil? And why does the leader of this group inevitably not have to do any real work? So this gets controversial, and that's something they had to navigate together. Yeah, it reminds me distinctly of a uh, trip that we all took years ago where we stayed in a communal house where the uh, the boss uh, who was staying with us in the house inevitably got the largest bedroom. I don't think, Matt, Matt, were you on that trip? I don't think I was. I, do, I don't know what we're referring to. Well, I'm not going to name names, obviously, but I think, Ben, you know what I'm referring to. I, I, thought, I, oh. thought you, I thought you went, but maybe you stayed in a different house. But maybe you didn't. Okay. I thought that you guys were there. But anyway, it's a, it's a, it's a flex, let's just say. Um, but, Ben, I, I think it's interesting. The idea of a hermitage, um, obviously, that's the name of Thomas Jefferson's home. Um, and, you know, it can refer to a secluded retreat uh, where one can live, you know, kind of away from society. But it also literally refers to the dwelling of a hermit. And that is exactly what he had um, built for him or, or they accommodated him um, because of, I think, probably they saw the worth of his, the work that he was doing. And they're like, OK, buddy, we'll make some compromises here for you. Well, yeah, um, guys, royalties. <laughs> he was bringing money into that abbey. You that's know? true, especially <laughs> after Seven Story Mountain. That is mm -hmm. absolutely true. Yeah, that's a very good point, Matt. And that doesn't necessarily mean the monastery was somehow crooked or sinister. No. This was a transparent agreement they had. That's his contribution, right? That's I don't right. have to touch the fertilizer because royalty checks. <laughs> mm -hmm. or, or probably phrase something like, I would love to help out, but the elders have instructed me yeah. <laughs> this is the way I should do it. It's it's funny because, if anything, this aspect of his life should be inspiring to a lot of us listening today because it just it shows how much you can create. You, listening now, you specifically, it shows how much you are capable of when you get the time and space to focus 
solely on the things you want to create. That's something that doesn't happen to a lot of people nowadays, and it is an immense privilege. Um, this isn't a perfect life. Uh, he does get shut down on some ideas. He wants to go to Mexico and work with a um, uh, first a, a student and then later a priest that he's been corresponding with, and he's told he he cannot do this, but he's still pushing to travel. He's got this correspondence going on with uh, what you could describe as his counterparts in Asia, monks from other religious orders. And in 1968, remember, that's the first date we dropped in today's episode, 1968, he travels to Asia uh, he's hanging out at the Red Cross, and he wants to meet and speak with monks from other religious traditions. If you look at his writings from this time and leading up to this time, he often seems to feel that he and his colleagues are at the cusp of some great spiritual awakening. Ben, do you think um, the leadership in, in the, the order that he was a part of had any kind of editorial oversight over his work or, or had to sign off since it definitely represented them? Yeah, I, I think there could be something where they would voice their approval or disapproval, but maybe not necessarily censorship, because he was very much, you know, he, he was very much sincere in his spiritual beliefs. So you could argue that he was kind of self-selecting already. Uh, but also very outspoken and uh, potentially very controversial. So I wonder if they maybe, you know, gave him a pass knowing that he was bringing at least attention, uh, whether good or bad, to their order. And like Matt was saying, those royalty checks. But uh, there were certainly people that did not care for his uh, his attitudes and ideas and which were, could maybe have been considered very radical. Um, and on that date that you mentioned, Ben, um, in December of 1968, he was found dead in a suburb of uh, Bangkok in Thailand. Yeah, about 15 miles away from Bangkok. He was at a place called Sawang Kaniwat, a Red Cross retreat center. So the story goes like this. He's found dead in his cottage, uh, he has he's sharing rooms with some other folks we'll meet in a moment. He was only wearing shorts. He was officially lying on his back with a short-circuited Hitachi fan across his body. Hitachi fan here is a brand name of electric floor fan, meaning it stands like a floor lamp, you know, and it's it's a few feet high. So there's a lot of controversy. Uh, according to the official report, the original official report from the Thai government, uh, the autopsy indicates the following general explanation for his death. He took a shower after a morning lecture and he was planning, you know, to have lunch. He walked out of the shower, slipped, had a, basically a banana peel moment with no banana. Uh, and then while he was falling backwards, he grabbed that fan nearby instinctively to try to steady himself. The fan had a short circuit and uh, electrocuted him. He had a wound on the back of his head. Uh, it's implied this is from his skull hitting the floor. And then because of the faulty wiring of the fan, he, was, he received an enormous electric shock that possibly caused a massive heart attack, but either way led to his death. It sure seems like a bit of bet hedging going on in this report where it's like, well, if he didn't get killed by the, the head wound, then the fan definitely took him out. Uh, so certainly no foul play here because there were two absolutely final destination style causes of death that could have been uh, at play here. So let's just move right along, shall we? Mm. Mm. Um, no, let's not. Let's make the episode because this is weird. Yes, it is. Yeah, this is very weird. The thing about, if you've read many autopsy reports, which is a weird thing to say in a sentence, but if you've read many of these, then what you notice is there are things that can be contributing factors to a cause of death, but there's ultimately supposed to be one cause of death. It's not a, uh, it's ideally not a multiple choice question, you yep. know, so this is already sus. And that's uh, why you do autopsies, right? That's, that's why, why we Well, did. that's why, yeah, that's why if you say you do them, you actually do them. Uh, so in a way, this is the beginning of the story. This moment around 3 p.m. December 10th, 1968. And for the people who don't accept the various official explanations 
before Thomas Merton's death, there are a lot of questions that remain. And we believe these are troubling questions, even decades and decades later. What are we talking about? We'll tell you after a word from our sponsors. Here's where it gets crazy. Okay, this is this is a tough one because we're doing this in one episode. Uh, there can be much more to the story. We encourage you to ride along with us for for the the rest of this show and also come back to us uh, with your own thoughts because we're condensing a lot of information here. And some of the information is still unavailable to the public uh, to this day. And we're, we're laboring under that constraint. So we've established some pretty, pretty solid stuff about Merton's life. And so with that, with what we know now, it might seem first kind of odd to question this guy's death. You know, who would want to murder a monk? What danger could a pacifist dedicated to spiritual awakenings pose to anyone? I mean, it's... At first blush, it seems weird, right? It seems like there's so many other people who should be murdered. You know what I mean? There are serial killers. There are war criminals. The list goes on. Ben, you just answered your own question. It's war criminals who fear pacifists. Hey, they're only criminals if they're caught, though. Oh, it's true. I'm just saying like to someone who thrives on war and makes money on mm. war, uh, the pacifist who truly can reach people's hearts and minds, it's possibly the most dangerous thing in existence. Yeah, I was thinking that later. It's, it's funny you mentioned that because I, I had that later in notes, too. I was thinking, you know, the pursuit of peace can itself to seem to some demographics to be incredibly dangerous and threatening. I want to continue on this. And I want to just give two other names and dates uh, to the conversation here. Add them to the mix as we're thinking about this and why people may have thought there was something else to the story. Consider that we're discussing December 10th, 1968, the death of a pacifist monk. Consider that in April of that same year, 1968, Martin Luther King Jr., a pacifist civil rights leader and church leader was killed, assassinated and consider uh, in June of that year, Robert F. Kennedy, a somewhat pacifist, at least pacifist leaning politician was assassinated. Yeah. And we know that, you know, the, the, the man who killed John Lennon was uh, likely uh, inspired by obsession and, and personal, you know, perceived vendetta. But we also know that John Lennon was tracked extensively by the FBI and that uh, dossiers and, uh, you know, files were kept on him for his uh, outspokenness on, on pacifism and, uh, you know, anti-Vietnam views. Well, and yeah. And who knows what you believe about how those men were killed or why they were killed or, you know, the, the various stories and theories behind their deaths. It's just pacifists were dying. Right. Right. Uh, at a time when there was comparatively little oversight of the actions and capacities of many factions of governments, not just the U S but the world's governments. And this is, this is exacerbated by the, the, the sheer fact that the U.S. is immensely powerful post-World War II. So if the Watchmen isn't going to watch itself, who will? Which sounds cryptic, but not unnecessarily so. And we're raising, we're raising good points here. So it's even possible that Merton may have alluded to the dangerous nature of his advocacy for peace in his own work during his lifetime. Uh, you can read some great articles in the Irish Times. They're pretty short, but they, they are dense with information. And in one, the reporter quotes his work, A Signed Confession of Crimes Against the State, in which he writes, in which Merton writes, quote, The very thoughts of a person like me are crimes against the state. All I have to do is think, and immediately I become guilty. And, he read 1984. Uh, well, yeah, right, uh, thought crime, but also I think that's something a lot of us listening in today can identify with in one capacity or another. And in the years following Merton's death, multiple people came forward objecting to the story. Uh, one guy, Jim Douglas, 
a friend of Merton's, raised the issue publicly multiple times, but he's not the only one. Uh, the people who have a problem with this also include some of the folks who were there that day, that December 10th. In 2016, and this is something you should remember for the end of this episode. In 2016, there's this theologian named Matthew Fox, no relation, I think, to the actor from Lost, who had maintained that Merton was assassinated by CIA agents active in Thailand at the time, in the late 1960s. And further, Fox claimed a member of the CIA actually told him that's what happened. Wait, you might be saying... Is this the end of the episode? No, no, just hold that. Just keep it keep it in the <laughs> front of your head or, you know, in a little pocket. On your, your shoulder. Ch- chest. Right here. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Put it in your shoe, but uh, put it somewhere where you can find it because we're coming back to that. What we need to point out now, what we need to introduce is for the people who believe that Thomas Merton was murdered, there is one book that stands above all others. It is called The Martyrdom of Thomas Merton, an Investigation. It's published in 2017, so it's it's relatively recent. Uh, it's by two authors, David Martin and Hugh Turley, and they, I think I said, you know, they walk through circumstances surrounding Merton's demise, but that's not true. They dive in. This book is obsessively researched, and they poke serious, serious holes in the official story. And it's a, it's a story that they say they find preposterous. And I'll be honest, if you read the book, they back it up 100%. You can also see right now, I know there's for sure one long interview with Hugh Turley. There are several places where he's spoken about it. I I didn't see much about Martin speaking on it, but I just didn't find it maybe in my in my search. But you can hear them discuss it if you're more into the video format or you want to listen. Just mm-hmm. if you're if you're not going to read the book. Yeah, it's somewhere between like a, a primary and secondary source because it is the author talking about the book that they wrote. And I think there's you may, are you talking about the Interview on YouTube, it's about 45 minutes or so. There are several on there. That, there's that's one, one I saw, yeah. Yeah, there's one that you can find. Just search for Hugh Turley and Thomas Merton, you'll find it. Yeah, so here's what, here's what the authors are talking about in the book. They say there are numerous issues with both how the story was initially reported, one, how it was investigated, two, and how the cause of death became official, Three, and uh, it gets so in depth so quickly. They focus on the accounts of several people, Merton's colleagues in the church and at this Red Cross retreat. Uh, one of the folks they focus on is Friar Francois de Grun. Uh, it was the last person known to have been with Merton when Merton returned to his room. Uh, after those lectures. And at this point, it is crucial to note the stories already don't match. From the moment de Grun leaves Merton and is the last person to see him alive, the stories start to spread and propagate and mutate, and they contradict each other at almost every imaginable point other than the fact that there is a man who is dead. Like, take the, the versions of how DeGrun found Merton's body in the first place. Because he, he's also, uh, important to note, mm-hmm. he's the last person who saw him alive and the first person who saw him dead. That's right. And there are three uh, versions of um, how the body was found, how DeGrun found Merton's body, uh, which kind of, again, ties into the whole, like, sus nature of, well, was it the fan that electrocuted him? Did he hit his head? What's the deal? Uh, And there are varying kind of accounts of this, some of which come directly from the monastery itself. Like, there's a, you know, version of the story that they have. Then there's the official report. It's all very strange. Uh, But uh, these are the versions of how DeGrun Grun potentially found Merton's body. So, one, the police reported that DeGrun heard a suspicious noise around 3 o'clock in the afternoon and ran downstairs. Um, they also went on to report that DeGrun went to Merton's room to grab a key. And then we have a report from Father Celestine Say, uh, who was on site at this um, Red Cross 
you know, what do you call it? Like, I guess, uh, compound. Um, he says that, say, says that uh, DeGrun went to ask Merton if he wanted to go for a little swim. And then the authors point out that all of these stories can't possibly all be true. And in fact, may all be untrue. Um, they conclude that what's most likely is DeGrun didn't go down to see Morton at all, but instead knocked on Father Say's door, um, prompting Say to discover Merton's body on the floor. So this is all we're getting into some kind of yeah, semantic y kind of splitting hairs thing. This doesn't feel particularly conspiratorial yet, even at this point. Like, what did these folks have to gain in covering this up? Uh, it just almost feels like a case of miscommunication or bad reporting at this point to me. Um, but we'll, we'll go on to see that it, uh, it, it also appears to be something much more than that. Well, we're, we're going to get into it, but a lot of what we know are from official Thai reports, Thai sources, right? And these men are English speakers in Thailand and, and dealing with authorities. And those authorities are then, you know, there's translation occurring reports are being made. I'm, I'm wondering if there's anything small there that was lost in translation. Uh, right. TM. Sure. Well, there's an important issue here, which is that, yeah, as the authors pointed out, these stories cannot all be true, but these folks are interviewed about what happens the day after the murder. So there's not enough time for memory to play the treacherous game of retrieval and reinterpretation. And already witnesses are disagreeing about something. When you are a witness to a murder, changing your story just even once is, incre is an incredibly bad move. And avoid it if you can because it makes people think that you are not telling the truth or you are unreliable. And both of those things are not a good look. They're not a, they're not a catbird seat exactly. But we do know there are three men and we say they discovered Merton's body. Later we'll find that apparently DeGrun didn't discover anything wrong with Merton at all. He just knocked on Say's door and then went off to tell other people. So these three guys who do actually go to Merton's room, Odo Haas, Egbert Donovan, who is an arch abbot, and uh, the previously mentioned official Say from the Philippines, they walk in, and according to the reports, they immediately know this guy is dead. And the fan is still running. Uh, this book, The Martyrdom, uh, spends a lot of time on the fan and the next few minutes. So according to this, Haas, Odo Haas, reaches out to move that fan, and he gets a shock, a little zippity zap, and say unplugs the fan. This shock, it's important to note, does not incapacitate Haas. It's... It's just enough to be unpleasant. Uh, and so Haas, apparently, the, the guys recognize something untoward has occurred. And so Haas says, hey, you know, say, go get your camera. Let's take some photos so police can see this. And probably does that moment we hear about in film so often, don't touch anything, right? Which is also what you should do. You shouldn't touch anything at a crime scene unless you're trying to cover up or alter a part of the crime scene. That's the only reason to touch stuff. You know, it's it's interesting hearing about this secondary interaction with the fan because much a lot is made. You know, much to do is made about this fan. But I mean, to me, you think you hear about you know this almost like cliche tropey way of committing suicide the idea of being in a bath and dropping like a toaster or like you know some sort of electrical appliance like a hair hair dryer or something in it would require some huge conductive force for that to probably be you know enough to kill you unless you just absolutely gripped the transformer you know while you were soaking wet um it seems like an awful lot to 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 ask for that to have been the the thing that actually killed merton um, but yet a lot of it is made of this fan. Yeah, yeah, especially in uh, the various versions, again, the various versions of the official reports. So there is a doctor at the center. Uh, there are a couple of doctors, obviously. It's the Red Cross. Uh, one of them is uh, Dr. Weist. Dr. Weist gets word of what uh, that something screwy is happening, and she is at the scene moments later as the news spreads through the retreat. And 
the doctor initially observes a third degree burn in the upper right abdominal area where the fan switch box, which is where you would turn the fan on and off, had uh, made contact with Merton's skin. Later, some of those other witnesses, including Say, will pardon me for this, say that they did not see any burns. Uh, The doctor also observes a series of strip-like burns on Merton's right arm and, perhaps most importantly, a, quote, bleeding wound on the back of his head. She concludes that Merton has been electrocuted, and when she does make that conclusion, she replaces the fan on Merton's body so that things will, quote, look as they have been found for the police. Don't touch anything, right? And just touch it and put it right back. <laughs> right, exactly. I'm just gonna do. You could touch it a little bit as a treat, but this is this is what is happening uh, at this time. And even though she concludes that electrocution has caused this guy's death, she's puzzled and rightly so because she can't figure out why he had fallen. Had he fainted? Did he have a dizzy spell? Did he have a heart attack? Why would she wonder that? Why wouldn't she say that he, like, slipped because his feet were wet from coming out of the shower? Well, it's because the shower itself, that that whole part of the narrative is also seriously called into question. Right, Matt? Yes, at least according to the authors who wrote the book about the investigation that we've been talking about here. Uh, According to them, that story was invented. Thomas Merton, at least according to them, there's no evidence, at least, that he took a shower, that he was wet when when any of this occurred. That story was allegedly written in 1973, several years, five years after his death, and it was written by someone named Brother Patrick Hart, uh, who who was, again... I'm only going off what I learned from that book's contents, but according to those authors, this person, Brother Hart, was a fairly new secretary to Thomas Merton, or at least fairly newly functioning secretary to Thomas Merton. Um, And for some reason or another, he wrote in the Asian journal of Thomas Merton uh, this thing, this story about the shower. Yeah, Patrick Hart is an interesting character, and the the people who believe that Thomas Merton was murdered uh, do spend a lot of time on how he propagated what is the dominant narrative of the death today. And this is one aspect of a larger problem, which is, again, the diffusion of story, right, and the way in which uh, these stories contradict each other. So the author's of the martyrdom don't just allege that authorities may have bungled this investigation. They say they straight up manufactured witness statements. And again, you know, you can find this book online. You can order it from your bookstore for Amazon. It's freely available. It's not classified or, you know, suppressed or anything, but it, when I read it, I thought they made some powerful arguments. Uh, One in particular is that, The only statement providing evidence that bad fan wiring might have immediately killed someone, the only primary statement, is super suspect. It looks fake. It looks so fake because it doesn't just contain hallmarks of a falsified police report. It contains the kind of hallmarks that indicate preferred methods of existing organizations that have falsified reports in the past. So it's kind of like... It's kind of like if you know someone who takes credit for stuff they didn't do or you're a uh, college professor and you've had the same 'er ne'er-do-well student multiple times in your classes, you can tell, like, you know their tricks. Mm -hmm. And that's kind of what these authors are saying. They have, like, little tells almost. They're little signatures almost of, you know, some kind of um, nefarious activity. Yeah, so this... Statement is supposedly from Odo Haas. He's the guy who survived the fan. Mm. And (laughs) I love that. Yeah. Should be the name of this surviving the fan. Could be the the subtitle of uh, this autobiography or this biography. And and this witness account has some pretty egregious errors. It doesn't match the stories of the other witnesses. Uh, In this, Odo Haas misspells 
the name of his, like the place where he lives, his own religious community in Korea, uh, the strength of the shock that he received from the fan is total is described totally differently from the way that other witnesses describe it. Perhaps most importantly, even though this is a witness statement, it is not signed. It bears no date. Nobody's exactly sure when it was written. It seems, and this is the belief of the authors of the martyrdom, it seems that this was written as a way to provide some uh, evidence or some support for the idea that this guy died by a fan. And there, there are a couple things that we should mention here that are really important. So in East Asia and the diaspora there, there is a there's an interesting series of urban legends or common beliefs about electric fans. And one of those is that you cannot leave a fan on at night because it may electrocute you due to wiring or that it may. What is the other one, Matt? I, I remember hearing this and I don't know if this is correct. The concept that you don't leave a fan on because of something with the air circulation and you may suffocate. I see. Yeah. So there are already like this, this idea of death by fan is something that kind of exists in, in nearby parts of the world. But also another deal with the fan that I wish more people pointed out, this guy, first off, Merton, if a shower occurred, he had a shared shower. I think like private bath, shared shower kind of situation. Uh, and other people would have been walking around this fan. Also, Merton himself, this isn't the first day he got there. He had touched the fan earlier. So what happened between the earlier encounters with the fan and the encounter on December 10th? It's a good question. We don't have an answer. Um, there are, you know, there are implications in the book and uh, in some other sources that say the fan may have been tampered with. But even that's tough because, again, we have two potential causes of death. Why were we so snarky about the autopsy? We'll tell you, because the medical investigation that did take place was also just so bizarrely suspect. That's right. Um, we have an account from Dr. Luxana Nakvachara, who was the uh, doctor that was assisting in the investigation. Um, and and he's, he's mentioned in the book. And according to official sources, he arrived there on site with the police and he completed his report on the same day as the death. I, I don't know what standard operating procedure is like in Thailand, but here you don't usually, I mean, you have a coroner or somebody to, you know, uh, declare somebody dead and make an official record. But typically you wouldn't have that information available so quickly. The idea that this report came out the same exact day as the death with no autopsy um, before the investigation of the fan itself and, you know, the actual mechanics of the fan um, before the interviews with the witnesses even were taken. Um, no autopsy. So uh, the, very strange. I mean, that's big. No it's, autopsy. It's, it's it's big, but even if even with all of those other factors, you still do an autopsy. There's not a situation where you just say, "Oh, we can skip the autopsy." That's sort of standard operating procedure, right? Yeah, standard. This isn't this, a standard case. Though. This is yeah, not a they, standard case. No, I just mean in general. Yeah, originally there is a uh, there is a report that there is an autopsy, but that turns out not to uh, not not to be the case. And yeah, this is where we really get into looking at the official documents that were generated through this whole ordeal and this the death of Thomas Merton. There are several, and the authors of this investigative book were able to get these official documents. And they noted that in several places, it says that there was an autopsy. But then there will be a, a handwritten note on the back by a responding officer or by someone uh, a police officer handling the investigation saying, no, there was no autopsy. Uh, just very, very strange. Right, right. It smacks of people trying to get their story straight, to be absolutely candid here. So this doctor, uh, Nakvachara, concludes, again, same day as the death, concludes cardiac failure has caused accidental falling into the fan, which is... Weird, 
because it means that this doctor made those conclusions before the investigation concluded or before it really began. They sort of set out with an idea where they say, okay, this is what happened. Let's make it look this way. Again, if you believe that there's conspiracy afoot, this is troubling for a ton of reasons. Later, Catholic officials on the scene, multiple, Multiple Catholic officials on the scene would say heart failure was a choice of convenience. It was a less complicated conclusion than electrocution. And even Merton's official biographer believes the electrocution angle was downplayed to avoid embarrassing the Red Cross or the Thai government uh, and Thai officials hosting them. So that could be one cover-up, but how did Thomas Merton actually die if there is a cover-up? And why do people believe he was murdered? We'll tell you after a word from our sponsor. So let's get into the theories. First, those authors, Turley and Martin, they think that Merton was struck in the back of the head, either by a pointed object or a bullet fired from a gun fitted with a silencer. People did report hearing a noise. It's, again, just like the shower. It's controversial. You don't know if it actually happened. And they also believe his body was later moved or repositioned as the before the investigation commenced. Uh, they say that Merton was lying on the floor, and originally his legs and arms were straight, and his palms were facing down, like you would put him in a coffin. And you'll remember that the Benedictine Father Celestine Say, who was Filipino, took those photographs um, at the crime scene, and they're basing their conclusions on those photographs with Merton's body laying on the floor, the fan still on top of his thigh, um, and reaching to the opposite side of his lower waist. Um, yeah. Yeah, and this is... So, it, things get dicey, because these guys decide to take photographs with Say's camera uh, because they don't... They want to get the evidence as accurately as possible before an investigation ensues. They don't know what's going to happen. They're being on the safe side with this. However, photographs of the scene have been withheld, and the authors of this book weren't able to get... They were able to view the photographs, but they weren't able to publish them in their work. Something really weird happens. So the Abbey in Kentucky, right, is... is Merton's home. And they say, you know, well, we want to have an autopsy done. And they ask the U.S. Embassy for help. And the U.S. Embassy says something really weird. They say, okay, well, according to the laws of Thailand, if there is an autopsy, Merton has to be buried in Thailand. And according to the authors, this is hogwash. This is like an invented law that someone in the embassy said for some reason. So instead of having an actual autopsy, which is said to have occurred in some of the paperwork but never actually happened, the Abbey just flies Merton's body back to the U.S. along with corpses of American soldiers. And the police report further doesn't make room to investigate homicide. I believe there are a total of two lines in the report that say there were no witnesses who might be suspected of causing the death. There's no reason to suspect criminal causes. And that's it. That's it. That's, oh, you really persuaded us. They just said, ah, don't think about it. Don't think about that part. So there are a couple possibilities. One theory, distressingly simple. The local police just messed up, just bungled the investigation several times. That's absolutely possible. Uh, and that happens even with the best of intentions and even with competent professionals working. People can make mistakes. Totally. And doesn't necessarily imply nefarious, you know, manipulation of evidence. I mean, there can just be honest mistakes. Well, but within that theory, you also have all the other theories that because if they bungled the investigation, it could have been he did actually die accidentally. He uh, was killed by someone that they never found and never even searched for. You know, there's it, it encompasses all of the things within that one concept. Yeah, exactly. And then there's another theory. What if the police and the U.S. government actively covered up a murder? Why would they do that? Well, at the time, the U.S. government and the Thai government were deep, deep, deep into some very shady things. Think about it. Thailand's allowing the U.S. to run bases for bombing raids in Vietnam and Laos. And Not Laos the- officially, right? 
unofficially uh, Laos? Well, this is the Indochina <laughs> War. Yeah. Okay, so, okay, okay. <laughs> uh, so between 1950 and 1975, a lot of money's changing hands. A ton of money. More than you might think. Thailand gets around $650 million in economic aid. Another $950 million earmarked just for defense and security. For comparison, $950 million is over 50% of Bangkok's own spending on its armed forces every year during that period. This doesn't count another $760 million for the vaguely phrased operating costs. Uh, the purchase or subsidized purchase of military equipment, payment for Thai troops in Vietnam, the list goes on and on. All in all, over a period of just 10 years, 1965 to 1975, that's over $2 billion in assistance, uh, making Thailand the second largest recipient of American aid in the entirety of Southeast Asia, second only, of course, to Vietnam. So what does this all have to do with this monk from Kentucky who is just like, hey, maybe let's not wage war on each other? Uh, well, he was staunchly opposed to the Indochina War, and that's the war that Thailand was actively pursuing with the U.S. So the authors here also point out that Thai officials are provably in bed with the CIA on illegal stuff. So they're working with Uncle Sam overall for Indochina War, but along with that, they're doing things like running drugs. They're doing things like uh, the Phoenix program. Oh, uh, that is a whole episode on its own, guys. I, have we not done that? We haven't. <laughs> we got to do that. The Phoenix program is this widely, I would say, unknown thing that existed during the Vietnam War. It's also widely misunderstood. And my goodness, if you read official CIA documentation or people writing for the CIA about it, you're going to get a very different picture than what you'll read about from uh, people writing about it outside of the CIA. And as is per usual, I suppose. But it was it was either an assassination program if you want to call it that, but I think that's oversimplifying it. It was it was a system of infiltrating uh, Viet Cong networks as well as attempting to identify those networks and individuals who are who are either on the military side or just the civilian side. Uh, and they operated not just in Vietnam. Right. Exactly. Yeah. You know what? Let's do a Phoenix program episode. It will be worth it. And it has ramifications that continue in the modern day. Yeah, I agreed. And you know what they did in the Phoenix program? When they caught someone, they tortured them. Fun. But you know what I'm thinking about, guys? The marks on his arm, the uh, burns on his arm, yeah. as well as the burn on his chest, as though maybe possibly Thomas Merton was tortured with electrocution. <laughs> oh, the ones that were blamed on this, uh, this fan that was uh, so important in the case. No evidence. No evidence for that. Just putting it out there. Good torture, though. I, effective torture, I would say, takes time. So if they were doing that kind of torture, that would just be purely sadism on the part of the assailants. But, um, but you know, it, it's a point that needs to be made. The CIA has manuals on assassination, and if you read the if you read them, they were leaked uh, a while back. Then you will see that by far the most preferred method for quietly removing someone from the chessboard is to make it look like an accident. That's why Frank Olson fell. That's why this guy. According to people who believe he's murdered, that's why he suddenly ran into a dangerous fan that was totally fine for days before. You want it to look like an accident. So this, this stuff with the CIA, aside from Phoenix Program, you know, there was an illicit drug business. We'll, we'll talk about that in Phoenix Program as well. Uh, this led the authors, um, Turley and Martin, to say that Helping dispose of a nettlesome monk who was interfering with the war effort would have been little more than routine business uh, for the CIA because they were actually closer with Thai police forces uh, than they were with the overall Thai government. That was more of a Uncle Sam kind of thing. But the CIA was down in the trenches. The issue is that this isn't hard evidence. They have a pretty good point when they note that the CIA had easily targeted Martin, and if it had targeted him for assassination, it could have reasonably assumed allies in the Thai police force would help facilitate that, and they would help cover up any loose ends in the aftermath. Later investigations do verify, they confirm that Merton, 
Like many other peace activists, as you had mentioned earlier, Matt, uh, he was on a CIA watch list. His mail was monitored and at times illegally intercepted. The FBI was watching as well. A group calling itself the Catholic Concerned Citizens had written uh, to Kentucky state legislatures asking them to declare Merton a dangerous radical. They forwarded it to the CIA and the CIA was like, oh, yeah, no, we're on it. We're, we're watching this guy already. Have you read his book, The Seven Story Mountain? It's actually pretty good. Anyway, <laughs> that's how they were talking. Uh, so in the end, there's a dilemma. That's why we said this is unsolved. The authors lay out a convincing case that multiple parts of this investigation were either bungled or purposefully misleading. And they don't provide hard proof that the CIA killed Merton to eliminate his anti-war activities, but they do point to numerous examples of CIA assassinations, assassination attempts, and stalking. Perhaps it's best for, uh, for you to look into the front of your mind, check your shoe, check that pocket we mentioned uh, where you remembered the statements of Matthew Fox, who straight up says the CIA confirmed Merton was murdered. In his opinion, they confirmed it. It's important to note that because if you look at the Thomas Merton Society, again, this is available online as well, you'll see that Matthew Fox actually spoke to three CIA agents, not one. The two, the first two he spoke with were in Southeast Asia at the time of Merton's death, not at the Red Cross Center, at least as far as we know. Uh, Fox had asked them straight up. He said, did you guys kill Thomas Merton? And the first replied, I will neither affirm nor deny it, which is a standard, it, it's a standard spy answer. Uh, the second said, you know, man, we had so much money at the time. We had no accountability whatsoever. If any CIA agent felt Merton was a threat to the country, they could have just had him killed. No questions asked. It would like it wouldn't have been a big deal, which is somehow even more terrifying than saying, "Yeah, we did it. And we carefully planned it because we didn't want to get caught." It's more like it makes it sound like a four thirty on a Friday decision. Like, ah, you know what? While we're here. You know, while yeah, we're here, let's just get it knocked out. You just ask a CIA agent, hey, yeah, could you have killed him? Sure. I don't know. I mean, maybe, you know, it was a wild time. <laughs> and, That's uh, crazy. Yeah, yeah. And it, it, and it should be frightening to people because that is an answer reflecting the reality of that, uh, of that era. So then later, Fox meets a third CIA agent and asks him again, just point blank, did you guys kill Thomas Merton? And the agent said the following. Yes, the agent replied, adding, the last 40 years of my life, I have been cleansing my soul from the actions I was involved in in the name of the CIA in Southeast Asia as a young man. I'm sorry, I didn't mean to laugh. I just have a hard time believing that a CIA agent would ever say anything like this. Well, yeah, you, you have to believe Matthew Fox that this actually occurred. Right? I do not believe that um, I believe Matthew there, Fox. It's there's no signed affidavit from that quote CIA officer who said those things, right? But if it's true, somebody feels bad about doing something terrible. It's tough. That that's what this whole story is, right? There's and I think that's what the what the authors of the book would say. There's not enough information to conclusively say we just have a lot of questions still. Right. And we know there's opportunity and capability, but that doesn't necessarily mean that these events happened. And that's, that's where we leave it today. Honestly, for Fox, that admission was proof that the CIA killed Thomas Merton and it prompted him to say Merton died a martyr for peace, as did his friend, Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. at the hands of the U.S. government. It hasn't been proven yet, but just looking at the investigation... It is riddled with problems. And at this point, uh, we want to hear from you. We want to hear what you think happened to Thomas Merton. Was this just well-intentioned bungling of a case? Was there something more insidious at play? And if so, uh, do you agree with uh, the author's idea of the culprit? Uh, on a personal note, uh, <clears throat> with this travel stuff, I, I think I'm going to be 
that I think I'm going to be on the East Coast for a while. Uh, I've had some I've had some uh, weird personal times, but I wanted to thank everybody uh, who took the time to support the show and uh, took the time to drop a, a little note my way or a uh, exciting lead to a future episode. So thank you all so much. Uh, also, if you know about a Another assassination or assassination conspiracy that deserves more attention and investigation. And we'd love to hear from you. We try to make it easy to find us online. We are absolutely easy to find in all the usual internet places of note. You can find us on Facebook, Twitter, and YouTube at Conspiracy Stuff. You can also find us on Instagram at Conspiracy Stuff Show. If you don't want to mess with the social media rigmarole, you can give us a telephone call at one eight three three S T D W Y T K. Yes, very easy. Just give yourself a cool nickname. The only one you cannot use is Max Powers, Astronaut with a Secret. Is that right, guys? Yes. Okay, cool. Let's see the smile from Ben. Yep, don't use that one. Uh, or Mission Control or Doc Holiday, Codename Doc Holiday. Or uh, I think, was it Maddie Both Hands? Maddie two, two Hands. Two Hands, yeah. Two, two hands. hands. Both Hands feels a bridge too far. <laughs> um, yes, give yourself one of those. It'll be fun for everybody. You've got three minutes. Say whatever you'd like. We'd love to hear from you in that way. If you have too much to say that won't fit in that three minutes, please instead send us an email. We are conspiracy at iHeartRadio.com. Stuff They Don't Want You to Know is a production of iHeartRadio. For more podcasts from iHeartRadio, visit the iHeartRadio app, Apple Podcasts, or wherever you listen to your favorite shows.